I would like to introduce Anne Bernays. Anne Bernays lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She is well-known and loved author of 10 novels and co-author of three nonfiction books. She's also a longtime teacher of writing at a number of universities in Massachusetts, include, some including Boston University, Boston College, Holy Cross, and Harvard. She has also published scores of essays, book reviews, travel pieces in national magazines and newspapers. Also, Anne was married to the late biographer Justin Kaplan. She's the mother of three, grandmother of six, and she's here to read today from her latest novel, The Man on the Third Floor. Annie Dillard, Dillard uh, noted about her book, I just love this book. It's my favorite of all her books by light years. Mm -hmm. So we look forward to traveling with Amber Nays. Please give her a warm welcome up here. I assume this is a very sophisticated and civilized audience because the theme of this novel is homosexuality. And uh, if, what do they used to say? If you think you're gonna be offended, leave the room. <laughs> After, new, after news of the unusual goings-on in my house finally escaped like a gas leak from a faulty stove, some of my so-called liberal New York City friends characterized my life using words that shocked even me, deplorable, disgusting, unnatural, selfish, hedonistic, bizarre. I hadn't hurt them in any way, hadn't threatened them, their, I hadn't threatened their way of life. Up, and then we, up until then, we had had a lot of fun together. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Actually, this didn't happen. What did happen was that I w was met with looks of incredulity fueled by moral judgment, averted eyes, hems and haws, and in some cases, total silence. I only imagined that they called me those things in the privacy of their own homes and to each other. Can you believe it, good old Walter, all these years? One or two of them, I guess, were secretly envious because I had managed to fool everyone for quite a while and because they would have liked to do as I had, but didn't have the nerve. The years when most of this occurred, a decade or more after the war ended, so you can figure we're in the 50s, belonged in a time when there were more secrets held tight to the heart than there were gold star mothers. In those days, not so long ago, men were supposed to cleave to their wives and women to their husbands. Any other combination was viewed as deviant. Psychologists listed these deviations in their diagnostic Bibles under sickness. I wasn't sick and I wasn't angry. I was an easygoing person, someone who kept his temper in check and who listened to what other people told him without yawning or interrupting. I was told by several people that I ex 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 exuded goodwill and prudence and had decent judgment. The people I worked with at Griffin House liked and respected me. My children, Henry and Kate, seemed to enjoy my company. My wife, Phyllis, was attached to me in her own way. She was an extremely attractive lady, and her enthusiasms affected people like a virus. <clears throat> I had my share of enemies. What man doesn't, especially in a competitive atmosphere like book publishing, but I knew I was an okay guy, generous, flexible, known for my snappy joke telling, especially during office Christmas parties. Mm -hmm. I picked up the check more often than not and put up with an incompetence as just another little glitch along the way. I also know that I didn't have the courage of a lion or a five-star general like Ike. I kept my public risk-taking to a minimum in f the fact that, in Tolstoy's words, I eventually took on the habit of passions was a kind of fluke, 
I never set out to install a man on the top floor of my house, and I kept those passions, actually I prefer the word love, hidden from everyone except their object. I think if someone hates you, they're probably doing so for the wrong reasons. I had a fairly easy time of it as a child, consider considering the disastrous history of some families, drunkenness, battery, betrayal, absence, and all-around filthy behavior. If my father was off limits emotionally and unable to empathize, and my mother not quite a whole person, I figure that's kind of par for the course at our stage of civilization. My mother, Belle Sampson, and married at tw uh, sorry, Belle Sampson, born Gisler and married at 20, was a starchy type who couldn't quite get the hang of how to relax. She was devoted to my father, both sentimentally and as what they used to call a helpmeet. He came first, the children second. We were hardly, hardly neglected, but, but if, say, she was reading to us and my father called out to her for some, something, she would stop reading to us. I had a younger sister, Constance, smart like me and chubby. When she was 12, she caught diphtheria and died three weeks later. This death virtually eradicated my mother's ability to laugh or smile for the rest of her life. Bell was always persuaded that if God chose the Jews, he was partial to the German branch of this tree. She was something of a snob. My father, Maurice, married to his friends, though not to his wife, the embodiment of Victorian rectitude and habits, died at the age of 67 when he fell from the super chief and cracked his skull against the platform in Newton, New Newton Kansas. Did you know that Newton here was, Newton out there was named after the Newton here? No. Yes. Maurice and his younger brother, David, ran Belchers, founded by their father in the 1880s. <clears throat> this was a department store on Lower Fifth Avenue and 19th Street. Belchers was the place women headed for, when, for whenever they needed curtains, crib, cribs, napkins, kitchen gadgets, lamps, maids' uniforms, quilts, notions. How many of you remember notions? <laughs> they don't have it anymore, do they? Yes? No. We got a yes and a no. Cutlery, dinner plates. <coughs> In other words, excuse me. My children wouldn't know what notions are. Cutlery, dinner plates. In other words, the list of items you couldn't pr purchase at Belcher's was extremely short. Belcher's made Maurice Sampson, nay Shapiro, a rich man and elevated him to that sector of New York society considered privileged and therefore obligated to donate money toward the health and security of the underprivileged. My father could afford to send me to private school and summer camp to, to enable me to move about more or less freely in New York living rooms, not generally welcoming to the Jewish community. He was on the board of several charities and was a member of the Orange Club, an establishment that admitted only German Jews. He was considered a real gent, he wore spats, carried him a lacquer cane and called every man he met, sir. When I was very young, my father raised his voice while talking to me as if I was deaf or a foreigner. It was very annoying. Eat your vegetables, he would shout. Sit up straight, stop, stop crying, sportsmanship. All of these instructions had a legitimate basis because I wasn't anything like the exemplary boy he wanted me to be. I was a crybaby. I was afraid of the dark. I wet my bed until I was almost 10. In spite of this, he was determined to instill the traits of manliness in me, sensing or seeing that this was an area that needed a lot of help. 
by demonstrating how to stand like a man with my hands in the pockets of my knickers and one le leg thrown, at, thrown to the front and side, a sort of devil-may-care gesture. He would have liked me to call other boys by their last names and give and receive noogies without a twinge, but instead of sneaking around with the boys to light up for a fin forbidden cigarette, I preferred to read in my room, Treasure Island, them that die will be the lucky ones. <laughs> <laughs> a sentence that scared me into imagined varieties of torture so awful they kept me awake at night. Journey to the Center of the Earth, Tom Sawyer, mm -hmm. and an assortment of childhood classics. I love to read and, and listen to music. Mozart, Bach, Debussy, especially Mozart, who seemed to be singing directly into my inner ear and to walk around the city by myself. The mean kids in my class at school called me sissy because I was a clumsy ad athlete and because I, didn't, I just didn't seem to have the stuff of an all-American boy. That was okay with me. I, fi I figured it was better to be a sissy than a bully. I never fancied making people afraid of me. But all this was hard on my father, who never stopped trying to make me into something I clearly wasn't. My mother, who had a somewhat more generous nature, comforted me whenever she could, but she was afraid of my father's temper and hadn't the grit to defy him. I promised myself that if I ever had a son of my own, I would never say things to him, the, the things to him that my father said to me. And if he turned to, out to be a professional, professional wrestler or a cook in a chop house, I'd keep my mouth shut and give him a hug. <clears throat> By the time I was 13 or so, I had decided it, that it was easier to try to get along with my parents, and especially my father, than to act sullen or provocative. I decided that I wouldn't reveal to them, him, to them who I was or what I was thinking. I felt like an actor in my own play, taking the starring role and being the nice, obedient child and young man they wanted me to be. It was hard at first, but I got adept at it, and gradually my father stopped picking on me. Though he never stopped asking me about which sports I was taking at school, he wanted it to be football, but it was, I'm going to use your technique. What do you think it was? Ballet. <laughs> <laughs> Not at school. Bad Fencing. Fencing. Chess. Chess and tennis. I love that technique. <laughs> I've never seen that done before. <clears throat> now, there, I, I'm going to skip an episode at camp, which is very graphic. And when I read this somewhere else, they said, why didn't you read it? We wanted to hear it. And I said, because then now you'll buy the book. <laughs> So he, he, goes to, he goes to work for a publishing house. He's very, he goes to Harvard, he's very, very bright. He has a huge IQ. Um, and it, he advances, and he's also very literary. <coughs> and he's, uh, people get along with him. He's not special. He, he, he isn't special, he's, you're odd every man, I guess. Looking behind me, I'm especially aware of just, this is, the, this is a little dicey, but I'm sure you're old enough to, to hear it. Looking behind me, I'm especially aware of just how chancy it was meeting Barry Rogers. It reminds me of the Thomas Hardy poem about the Titanic and the iceberg. Hardy, of course, believed in fate believed that the convergence of the, these twains, as he, uh, twain as he called them, had something of the supernatural about it. The gods were cooking something up for the ship, if not for the iceberg. When you make a connection that could happen only once, the, that connection takes on an extra significance that you can call anything, uh, anything you want, accident, coinc coinc coincidence, fate. 
I sat in my office one afternoon reading a manuscript sent me by one of the most senior agents, a man who had represented H.G. Wells, Somerset Mom, John Steinbeck, and Daphne du Maurier. He was known to have the most productive and lucrative stable in the business, which meant that when one of his submissions arrived by messenger, you dropped everything to read it. It did not mean, however, that everything he sent over was publishable. This manuscript was crammed with stale ideas, equally stale characters, and an exotic setting about as convincing as the backdrop of jungle in a sixth grade play. <coughs> the author was a so celebrated so storyteller, so I could only conclude that this was something that had been moldering in a bottom drawer of his desk for years. Someone knocked on the door. <coughs> I was delighted by the interruption. I told whoever it was to come in. A young man, I guess to be about 27 or 8, entered briskly. I noticed his face first. He had the look of a swarthy angel, radiating beauty like that of an Italian noble in a Renaissance portrait. His mouth was full and slightly crooked. His eyes were dark, almost black. They shone as if polished. My heart beat rapidly and my chest tightened. I couldn't tell what was going on, except that I knew I was looking at this man as if he were a, a what? <laughs> what can I do, do for you, I said. He was wearing dark blue pants, thick soled shoes, and a thin Eisenhower jacket. He carried a clipboard and a pencil. I'm supposed to measure your, car your room for a new carpet. Really, I said. No one told me. He consulted his clipboard. You're Mr. S you're Mr. Sampson. That's what they tell me. This won't take more than a few minutes, he said. I'll try not to disturb you. Disturb me? He had disturbed me profoundly. I n nodded, meaning nothing, temporizing. I pretended to go back to the manuscript, trying desperately to shake off the effect created by the man's bent back and powerful legs. What's your name, I said. I hadn't meant to say this out loud, but apparently I had, <laughs> because he said, Barry. Barry? Barry Rogers. He took from his jacket pocket a large object, which turns out to be a length of metal measuring tape on a <coughs> reel. I looked again at his black hair, his beaky nose and olive skin, there was no way he was Rogers. But this was America, the land of altered names. If he was aware of my staring at him, Barry Rogers did not let on as he measured, wrote, measured again, wrote again, bending, straightening, doing a dance around the room. In fact, humming very softly to himself. My reactions to this Figaro suddenly reminded me of Harmon Stroud, who was the guy he had sex with at camp. And what we had done at summer camp came out of my memory's hospital room, <laughs> revived and sent dangerous warmth throughout my body. Thank God I was sitting down. Bits of thought presented themselves, one of them being that somewhere deep there were, lurked a Walt, Walter Sampson who might want to be loved by a man more than by a woman. At the same time, I dismissed this notion, how could that be true when I was married, had children, and considered my life a model of productive domesticity? Was Barry homosexual? Did he know what was going on? I'm just about, three minutes? Thanks. I'm just about done, he said, standing up straight. It'll work out perfectly. And stowing the tape measure in his pocket, he walked over to the window, Nice view you've got here, he said. Still, he made no movement toward the door. I like it, I said, swallowing hard. Who did you say you work for? Winchester Carpets, he said. We do mostly commercial jobs. They, wa they all want wall to wall these days. If you ask me, I like to see some wood flooring with some nice polish. It's classier than a rug. But I probably shouldn't be saying this. I nodded, partly because I agreed with him and partly because I couldn't trust myself to speak without sounding like I was strangling. What Barry was saying was banal, to, but to my ears, and at that moment he was like 
it was like the prose in the King James Version of the Bible. For a sec second, we looked straight into each other's eyes. Then we both looked down, gripped by caution. Well, I'll be going now, Barry said. I'm supposed to be doing Mr. Forst Forstman's room next. He gets the best grade of carpeting, we turn out. Oh, with that stinging remark, the lovely young man turned and headed for the door. My chest tightened. I couldn't bear the thought that I might never see him again. I coughed. Did you say something? No, but I was thinking, no, never mind. No, he said, you did say something. I was wondering if you would like to meet me for a drink later after work, if you're free, of course. Truly, I hadn't meant to say this. The invitation came out involuntarily like a hiccup. Something I had no control over was drawing me into something that might be risky. My life had been wrinkle-free up up till now, and I'm going to skip a little because I think I'm, it's time's up, but I just want you, to, all of you to remember that during the 50s, homosexuality, homosexuality was one notch up from a terrible crime. Sure, he said he's, he agrees to come. That would be okay, I guess. He was casual enough, as if he'd been expecting this invitation from the moment he looked at me, sitting behind my white-collar de uh, white desk. I, dis I covered my pleasure at his answer and suggested we meet at an out-of-the-way place I sometimes stopped in aft after work for solitary whiskey, whiskey before heading home to wife and children. Barry said he would meet me at a quarter to six. Your name's Samson, right? Like the Bible? Samson liked the Bible, I said. See you in a while. I looked at my watch. It was just before three. <clears throat> How could I stand to wait for three hours before seeing him again? I couldn't work for the rest of the afternoon because I was so scared he would change his mind and fail to show up. Thank you. My hands are large and leathery, with big knuckles and uneven cracked fingernails. Rounded patches across the back of my left hand hold the history of childhood warts. Thin scars line my fingers, the result of working with too much speed and not enough caution. My hands are functional only, not things of beauty. I figure my hands, like my height, 5'9", as are about the size of the average American man's, which you can imagine was not the happiest observation as a young girl. More than their size, though, my hand's unprettiness, their unloveliness, their plainness, paradoxically stood out. Even in my teens, my hands resembled a much older woman's, worn and lined with slightly misshapen fingers like old leather gloves. They were nev never graceful or suited to adornment. I always knew my hands would have looked absurd with painted fingernails. When I was younger, I envied my friends their delicately tapered fingers and clear unlined skin. I dreamed about slipping my smaller hand into a boyfriend's larger one. More recently, my fingernails have grown cracked from chlorine and wintertime swimming pools. They've begun to develop the vertical ridges that grace the elderly in my family. My left ring finger was badly dislocated and has retained an odd lump at the first knuckle. But also, over time, I've learned that my capable hands are true to their appearance. I can whisk egg whites or execute complicated hand slap clap games with children or cut sheetrock. I thought I had come to peace with my large unpretty hands because I love what they can do. In my middle years, though, I surprised myself by falling in love with a man who has twinkling eyes and tall stature, but smallish hands. Capable, but not big. Our hands illustrate other differences about us, too. My aesthetic is plainer, his more graceful. I marvel at his economy of motion. He marvels at the depth of my engagement. He draws the world's attention more comfortably than I, but I've softened in the glow of his attention to me. I wasn't completely surprised when he proposed romantically with roses, except I was startled by the sparkling, fabulous diamond ring he gave me. Later he told me, I told him, I'm just not a big ring kind of person. He told me, but the ring means I love you and I want to marry you. 
I understood that message, but I had trouble actually wearing the ring, which he noticed, of course. Why don't you wear it, he asked me, with hurt in his not twinkling right then eyes. Does it mean you're saying no? I didn't know how to tell him. I wanted to be with him, but the ring seemed wrong. When I did wear it, I felt uncomfortable, like I was masquerading. When people looked at my ring, I cringed to realize that they also took in the big working hand and that lumpy finger on which it rode. I felt disloyal to my hands, which had served me so well. Why should they have to play the role of the ugly background for this expensive bauble? I tried to explain. I don't have the right hand for this ring. He looked right in my eyes as he took my hands in his. Mine didn't feel too big, even though our hands are exactly the same size. I love your hands, he told me. Yours is exactly the hand I want to wear this ring. I said yes. I still take the ring off when I'm traveling or spreading grout or mixing meatloaf. But I realize now that both my strong hands and the lovely contradictory ring display truths that I value. Looking down at my working hand adorned by this unlikely gem, I see both the unexpected grace and of his love and acceptance, as well as the sturdiness of the relationship we're building. Just walk.